Some years ago when I was a child, we were living on a farm out in California. And one day we didn't finish picking the squash in the field before nightfall. And because the squash grow quite rapidly, we had to pick them the early the next morning or else they would be unfit for the market. And so my father had us rise up early in the morning while it was still pitch dark. And we went over to the squash field. The field is about four miles away from our house. By the time we arrived there, it was just enough light to be able to start picking squash. Well, we began picking squash and it was a nice cool summer morning. And as we were out there picking that squash one that day, we noticed that uh, every few minutes it got a little bit brighter and a little bit brighter. Still no sunshine, but uh, this, it was getting brighter. You can see a little bit clearer. And finally from the eastern horizon, the sun peaked its head over the uh, horizon. And little by little it began getting brighter and brighter. And we finally finished picking the squash. We took it out to the market. And as the day got uh, longer, it was finally got really, really hot. California summer heat. Well, anyway, as I think about that particular experience of the sun rising little by little, I am reminded of the statement in Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 18. Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 18, it says, But the path of the just is as the shining light that shineth more and more unto the perfect day. The path of God's people, the more they go, the brighter it gets. The sun is not in the noonday blaze in the very beginning. It goes little by little, and as we get used to it, it gets brighter and brighter. And the same thing happens in our own lives. God wants us to experience cleansing. God wants us to experience the purification. He wants us to live a sinless life. But it all doesn't happen at once. Let us examine this process of Christian growth that we call sanctification. To begin with, I want us to remember a little bit about the cleansing that we were talking about in the last video. Let us look at Romans chapter 3 and verse 24 through 26. Being justified freely by His grace, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God had set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood, to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. He declares His righteousness for the forgiveness of sins of the past. To declare, I say at this time, His righteousness, that He might be just and the justifier of him that believeth in Jesus. This is the work that God has in the last video that we were looking at. But now we want to look a little bit more about that progressive work, the progressive work of the path of the just, which shineth more and more unto the perfect day. When we talk about sanctification, or we talk about living a life of a Christian, we are talking about a work that is progressive. Let us look at 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 1. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Notice it says here that we're to do what? We are to be perfecting holiness in the fear of God. So this holiness needs to be perfected. You may think to yourself, well how can you perfect holiness? Well obviously here it give, brings to view that there are different stages of holiness. Those whom Paul is addressing were actually Christians. He is addressing the Christian church. He is addressing the church in Corinth. And yet they needed to cleanse themselves. They needed to perfect holiness or they needed to become sanctified. The same sentiment is expressed in some of these other texts as well in the Bible. Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 1. Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 1. Therefore leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith towards God. 
So this verse also brings that same idea. We're not to be still in the same quagmire, going over and over in the same ground. No, we must go onward in the path to perfection. Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3 is another verse that also talks about this growth in perfection. Philippians chapter 3. And let us look at verses 12 through 14. Not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Oh, he says that we must do what? We are to forget those things that are behind and we are not to act as if we have already attained. We are not to think that, oh, we are now at the pinnacle of Christianity and this is enough. No, we must go on unto perfection. In 2 Peter chapter 1 verses 5 through 9, 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 5 to 9 again brings to view this growth in grace. It says, and besides this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind, and cannot see afar off, and had forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. So we find here in these verses, that in the Christian growth, in the Christian life, there is a growth process. We are to add one grace to another grace. We cannot remain standing still. God does not want us as Christians to remain in the same place year after year after year. But we are to grow in grace. In this passage, the Apostle addresses those who have obtained like precious faith. Did you notice that? In verse 1, Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them who have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. He is not talking to those that have not experienced this yet. No, he says to those who have obtained the like precious faith. Those who are already Christians, they need to grow in grace. They need to add virtue to virtue. He urges progressive advancement in the holiness towards completion in the Christian character. When we experience conversion, something happens immediately. Something is a direct change happens in our life, but the change is not complete. The young convert stands on the platform of faith. He has seen sin in its true light. He has repented of his sins and has been cleansed from the same by faith in the merits and efficacy of the blood of Christ. And now he rejoices in his Savior. But he must advance in holiness by adding to his faith virtue and to virtue knowledge and the rest of the Christian graces. From this it appears that this work of sanctification, this work of growth is not the work of a moment. It is not instantaneous, but rather it is a work of a lifetime. Unfortunately, some people believe that sanctification is instantaneous work. But you see, the Bible doesn't show that. Apostle Paul never rested, never felt confident, oh, I have now arrived. He says, no, not as though I were arrived. He says, we must go on unto perfection. We're not talking about still being down in the same sins. We're not talking about never overcoming. That is not sanctification. No, sanctification is not that. Because when we talk about the gospel in Romans chapter 1, verse 16, Paul says, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. So if the gospel of Christ is the power of God unto salvation, it's not the same sin going over and over and over again. No, God gives us power to have victory. That His name shall be called Jesus in Matthew 1.21. His name shall be called Jesus, for He shall save His people from their sins. Jesus breaks this power of sin that controls our lives at our conversion. But we must then grow in grace. 
the original illustration, Proverbs chapter 4, 18 says, But the path of the just is as the shining light that shineth more and more unto the perfect day. That means that the sh light is getting brighter. The Christian walk is getting brighter. In John chapter 8 and verse 12, John chapter 8 and verse 12, then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. So Jesus says that He is the light of the world. So this light that shines more and more in our life is the light of Jesus Christ. This must be continually burning brighter and brighter. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 4 and 6, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 4 to 6. Here again it talks about Jesus being the light of the world. It says, In whom the God of this world had blinded the minds of them which believed not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. That's right, this light is Jesus. Now, how does Jesus shine into our hearts? How do we obtain the light of Jesus in our lives? Psalm 119, verse 105. Psalm 119, verse 105. It says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. What is the light that shines? It is the Word of God. This Word we remember studying in previous passages is Jesus Christ in John 1, 14, etc. Now what does this Word do? What does the Word of God do as we keep eating and making, partaking of this Word in our daily life? What does it do to us? John chapter 17 and verse 17. John 17 and verse 17. What does the Word of God do to us? It says, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. What does it say here? That, that we are sanctified through what? We are sanctified through the truth. The word of God is the truth that brings us sanctification. So when we are studying the word of God, the Bible reveals to us things that we never knew were sins. We had no idea this was sin. And this is what we're talking about when we speak about sanctification. And when God reveals the sin to you, what should you do? Well, what did we study in our last hour? What did we study in that last tape? We studied that if we confess our sins, remember John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So if God reveals to you through His Word that something is a sin today, what do you do? Confess it. Once you confess it, He will forgive you and He will cleanse you. And what is that? That is the process of sanctification. That's what we're talking about when we talk about sanctification. Now, how are we to be sanctified? How do we go in this process of sanctification? Leviticus chapter 20, verses 7 and 8. Leviticus 20, verses 7 and 8. It says, Sanctify yourselves, therefore, and be ye holy, for I am the Lord your God. And you shall keep my statutes and do them. I am the Lord which does sanctify you. It is God that does the work of sanctification in us. But we are to sanctify ourselves. We are to dedicate ourselves to God. As we commit ourselves to God every single day. As we study the Word of God. The Word of God being the lamp unto our feet and the light unto our path. As we read that Word. As we make it a part of us. As we grow in these things then we keep experiencing that confession on a daily basis. This is why Colossians chapter 2, verse 6 is so important. Colossians 2, verse 6, which says, As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus, so walk ye in Him. So in the same way that we receive Christ, we walk in that same way. That's right. Confession is the very beginning all the time. So when Jesus reveals Himself to us, when we are 
under, when we are sanctified through the truth, when He reveals something new to us that we did not know before, we walk in the same way we did before. We experience that confession of our sins anew every single day. That's right, as we go on unto perfection, Hebrews 6, 1 again, let us go on unto perfection. We are not to remain where we are, but keep growing and growing and growing. Now, the next question may come to us. If we are made righteous or holy, how can we be made more righteous? How is it possible? Well, Jesus gave us an illustration in Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4, verses 26 through 29, Jesus gave us a very beautiful illustration of the Christian walk. Mark chapter 4, verses 26 through 29. And He said, So is the kingdom of God, as if a man should cast seed into the ground, and should sleep and rise night and day, and the seed should spring and grow up, he knoweth not how. For the earth bringeth forth fruit of herself, first the blade, then the ear, after that the full corn in the ear. Notice verse 29, But when the fruit is brought forth, immediately he put it in the sickle, because the harvest is come. So from this lesson we learn that the kingdom of heaven is like when we plant some seed. You plant the seed and what does it do? It sprouts. It begins very small. Is it perfect? Yes, it is. It is perfect when, you, when it begins growing. But it's not to remain that way. With the life that God gives us, there is a natural inborn growth. If a plant is not growing constantly, it's actually dying. That's what happens in our Christian life. It's like that little seed. It must grow and grow and grow. First the blade, then the ear, then the full corn in the ear. Now we take a look at the experience of John the disciple. John was a teacher of holiness. And in his letters to the church, he laid down unerring rules for the conduct of Christians. Let's take a look at some of those rules. In 1 John chapter 3 and verse 3. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 3. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself even as he is pure. If we have the hope, in the previous verses talking about the coming of Jesus, if we have this hope, what are we going to do? We're going to purify ourselves even as he is pure. In other words, there's a purification process in the Christian life. Also, 1 John chapter 2 and verse 6. 1 John 2 verse 6. He that saith he abideth in him ought himself also to walk even as he walked. So if we are, say we are abiding in Christ, we need to have the walk of Jesus. And that walk is a continual walk in growth. Also 1 John 2 verse 3 to 6. And hereby do we know that we know Him, if we keep His commandments. He that saith, I know Him, and keepeth not His commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoso keepeth His word, in him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby we know that we are in Him. Notice here, what is happening here? The love of God is being perfected in our life. So in 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 3, we find the will of God for us. In our Christian life, what does God desire? What is His will for each individual Christian? 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 3, it says, For this is the will of God, even your sanctification. So what is the will of God for us? It says here, For this is the will of God, even your sanctification. So God's desire, God wanting us as Christians that we grow in grace. It is not just justification that we are forgiven of our sins, but that we actually have victory and that we grow on from grace to grace, from learning one thing to the next. This is the desire for God. The sanctification of the church is God's object in all His dealings with His people. For this reason in Ephesians we find about a characteristic of the church when He comes again. What is it going to be? Ephesians 5 verse 27. That He might present it to Himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Yes, God wants us to be holy and without blemish. So this is the plan that God has for us. 
He has chosen us from eternity that, he might, that we might be holy. He gave His Son to die for us that we might be sanctified through obedience to the truth, divested of the littleness of self. From them He requires a personal work, a personal surrender. God wants us as Christians to have that personal work of surrender. In James chapter 4, verse 7, James 4, verse 7 says, Submit yourselves therefore to God. What does He want us to do? He wants us to submit. It's the work of submission that God wants in our life. God can be honored by those who profess to believe in Him only as they conform to His image. Let's look at Romans chapter 12 and verse 2. Romans chapter 12 and verse 2. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So God wants us as Christians not to conform to the world, not to become more and more like the world. Oh, no. He wants us to become transformed into the nature that He has for us. So true sanctification, it comes through the working out of this principle of love. You know, God is love, and He that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in Him. The life of him in whose heart Christ abides will reveal a practical godliness. The character will be purified. The character will be elevated. It will be ennobled. It will be glorified in his image and controlled by his spirit. Then as a witness for the Savior, we may know what divine grace has done for us. True sanctification comes from the principle of of love. We just mentioned that. Love is the thing that must be guiding us. We are serving Christ not because we have to, but because we love to. You see, it is love to God that we are sharing and that's what the growth in grace is all about. The character will be purified as we love God supremely. Those who would gain a blessing of sanctification must first learn the meaning of self-sacrifice. The cross of Christ is the central pillar on which hangs the far more exceeding and eternal sacrifice any man will ever have. Jesus said, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. It is only as we take up that cross that we're able to grow in grace. It is the fragrance of our love for our fellow man that reveals our love for God. This is why, as we were studying before, that love to our neighbor is the, will reflect in love to God. But now sanctification is not a work of a moment. It's a work of our entire life, of growing in grace. It's not a feeling. You know, faith, it says in Romans 1, 17, the just shall live by faith. Faith is not a feeling. Faith is, faith is not just some exhilaration that we feel for a few moments. No. Faith is a divine principle and we need to grow in grace. In Romans chapter 7, Romans chapter 7 and verse 18, as Apostle Paul looks upon himself, he comes to this conclusion. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For the will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. The natural condition of a man is not perfection. We can never sit down and think, oh, I have arrived. This verse shows that we can never come to the point of trusting ourselves. We are totally untrustworthy. Rather than trusting in ourselves, what should we be glorying in constantly? Galatians chapter 6 and verse 14. Galatians 6 and verse 14. But God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. No, we should not glory in ourselves, but in the cross of Jesus Christ. For this reason, we can never come from our lips and saying, Yes, I am holy. I have arrived. I am perfect. That can never come from a mortal lips. Let the recording angels write the history of our struggles and our conflicts of the people of God. Let them record their prayers and their tears. But let not God be dishonored by the declarations from human lips saying, I am sinless, I am holy. 
sanctified lips will never give utterance to such presumptuous words. You know, in 1 John chapter 1, as he's talking about perfection and purification, he also gives this warning. 1 John chapter 1 and verse 8. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If someone says, oh, I am holy, I am sinless, you know that that person is a liar. That's what the Word of God says here. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. For this, for this reason, we are not to think that we have arrived. Apostle Paul, we read in Philippians 3 verse 12, I just want to repeat it again. The Apostle Paul says, Not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after. He didn't say, I have already made it. Never did that come off his lips. Let the angels of God write of Paul's victories in fighting the good fight of faith. Let heaven rejoice in his steadfastness toward walking up the heavenward journey, and that keeping the prize in view, he counts every other consideration dross. Angels rejoice to tell of the triumphs and the victories, but Paul makes no boast. He never boasts of his attainments. The attitude of Paul is the attitude that every follower of Christ should take as he urges his way onward in the strife for the immortal crown. All of us need to have that same type of experience. Let those who feel inclined to make a high profession of holiness look at the mirror of the law of God. In James chapter 1, verses 22 to 25, it talks about that mirror. James chapter 1, verse 22 to 25 says, For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. You see, when we come to a mirror, what do we do with a mirror? We come to a mirror, we take a look at a mirror, and then what? We just walk away if we are filthy? No, we need to take a look at that law of liberty. If we think that we are perfect, if we think we have arrived, then we have yet to take a look and understand that law. <clears throat> as we see the far-reaching claims of the law and understand its work as a discerner in thoughts of the intents of the heart, we will not boast of sinlessness. It will never come to us. John did not teach that salvation was to be earned by obedience. No, that's not what we're talking about here. But we teach that obedience was the fruit of faith and love. John chapter 14 and verse 15. John chapter 14 and verse 15. Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. That's right. We have that principle of love is born in our hearts. That principle is instilled there. And we keep the commandments as a result of that love. That's why the more we learn about God, the more we love Him, and the more the result is obedience. That is the natural result. In 1 John 3, verse 5 and 6, 1 John chapter 3, verses 5 and 6, it continues the same thought. And ye know that He was manifested to take away our sins, and in Him is no sin. Whosoever abideth in Him sinneth not, Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. You see, if we abide in Christ, if we abide in the love of God as it dwells in our hearts, then our feelings, our thoughts, our actions will be in harmony with the will of God. That's right. It will be in the will of God. We will love Him with all our heart. The sanctified heart is in harmony with the precepts of God's law. It's amazing how many times I hear someone telling me, oh, I'm perfect already, and yet they go deliberately to disobey God. How can we do that? That is impossible. Just want to read a little paragraph here from the book, Acts of the Apostles. It says, There are many who through striving to obey God's commandments have little peace or joy. This lack in their experience is the result of their failure to exercise faith. 
They walk as it were in a salt land, a parched wilderness. They claim little when they might claim much. For there is no limit to the promises of God. No, God's promises are vast. God's promises are limitless. And we have the opportunity, we have the privilege to claim those promises. Such ones do not correctly represent the sanctification that comes through obedience to the truth. The Lord would have all His sons and daughters happy, peaceful, and obedient. Through the exercise of faith, the believer comes into possession of these blessings. Through faith, every deficiency of character may be supplied, every defilement cleansed, every fault corrected, every excellence developed. You see, when we talk about justification we talked about in the last video about confession yes that is where everything begins we must understand that confession begins the whole process first of all in this what we have studied so far number one we come to the understanding of the Word of God we must come to understand what the Word of God is. That Word, what does it do? It reveals sin. It shows us what is right, and so by showing us what is right, it reveals sin in our character. Now, what we do from here will determine our Christian experience. What we need to do here, as we've studied now so far, we must confess confess our sins. The sins that God reveals to us, we must confess them. And 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. So what, is, what happens when we, are, when we receive true, heartfelt confession? What happens next? Well, God does something. He forgives. He forgives our sins. But that's not enough. He does something else. He cleanses us. From what? From all unrighteousness. He cleanses us from all unrighteousness. And what should we do here? Should we stop now, now that we've received the cleansing? Remember that passage there in 2 Timothy where it says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. In other words, this process is a continual process that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So this process continues. We then learn more about the Word of God. He reveals His truth to us. And the closer we come to Jesus, the closer we come to the knowledge of Him, the more defective we will see. And the more we can turn to Him and receive that confession, receive that cleansing of heart. Jesus is speaking to you today. Matthew 4, verse 18 and 19. And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. Here they were, working and fishing for fish. And he said unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Jesus is speaking to you today. He says, follow me. Not just the first step of the way, but every step of the way. As we follow Jesus, He will lead us on from one step to another until we shall be like Enoch and some of the others when we're one step between us and the eternal world. And Jesus will say, come on up. Come be with me and let us spend eternity together. I look forward to that time. And right now you have the opportunity. Jesus is calling you. Follow me. Now is your opportunity. Now is your time to experience this type of sanctification.